able to hear me all right? I probably don't need the mic, so if I get too loud, just yell at me. Um, that's kind of how I am. So this talk is about hacking Postgres. Um, this is going to be more focused on the actual back end, so we're going to touch things that you probably wouldn't be messing with if you were just writing an extension or something along those lines. Um, this is actually based loosely on a patch that I wrote up and then was subsequently rejected for very obvious reasons that I'll get to in the talk. Um, so unfortunately, what's in here is not actually committed. I still have some hope that maybe one day it will be. Um, we'll see. <laughs> I, I know uh, there are some folks out here who know what it is and are very interested in having it, so I still think it's worthwhile. Um, but that's another discussion. All right, so who am I? Um, I'm a Postgres major contributor. Um, I've been working with the project for quite a number of years now. Um, I implemented the role system in 8.3. I implemented comparable privileges in 8.4. I've done lots of contributions in other areas. Uh, PLP GSQL is one that I've been messing with more recently. Um, I did four each um, with some other folks helping, but that was a good one. I also contributed to PostGIS. Um, I currently work for a company called Resonate. We are looking to hire, in particular, not so much database folks. We're really looking for operations type folks. So if you want to work in the Northern Virginia area, which is a fantastic area to work in, and you want to do operations, Linux, Hadoop, Postgres, big data stuff, let me know. Um, or email techjobs at resonateinsights.com. Um, yeah, good enough. Um, I, I decided to stick this in there because the person that I stole this uh, slide management, slide writing system from, had it in his slides. So I figured maybe he'd like me to include it in mine as well. <laughs> Thank you, Magnus. So you should all read planet.postgresql.org because it is pretty cool. It, uh, there's good stuff available there. All right, so let's jump in, all right? At the very top level of the Postgres source tree, these are your, you know, the directories that actually kind of matter, right? So you've got your contrib modules, you've got your documentation, um, and then you've got your source code, right? We're going to look in the source code directory for this. Um, in the back end, it's the actual Postgres back end itself. That's where we're going to mostly focus because this talk is about hacking the back end. Um, but I wanted to hit on some of the other pieces, right? Um, in here, you've also got SRC bin, which is where the definite, you know, all the code is for PG dump, PSQL, those kind of utilities. and You'd be surprised you actually don't have to modify those as much as you might think, but there are cases where you need to make sure you're adding PG dump support, for example, um, or maybe you do something cool and you need to change PSQL to pull out some new column in some catalog table that you've you know, added. Um, common code, this is actually relatively new. We're starting to have um, a set of code that's actually common to both the back end and the front end code. Um, there's not a lot there right now, but that's actually an interesting project if people want to look at it because there are cases where we probably could move more code into there. Um, the include directory is actually massively important, but the one that's even more important is the other one. Uh, we'll get to that later. Um, the interfaces directory, you have libpq and ecpg. Um, libpq is probably the one that's more interesting. Uh, I don't know. Does anybody here use ECPG? Okay. Well, that's telling. Um, <laughs> no one. That's great. Um, all right. Are you having the past? Okay. Well, somebody has in the past. It's, we have. How many people in here know what ECPG is? Okay. All right. All right. All right. So that's it's not so bad. Um, all right. Um, uh, the PL directory is where all of our procedural languages are. So if you want to go look at PLPGSQL or PL Tickle or PL Perl, that's where you would go find how those are all written and what they do and how they work and how they interact with the back end. Um, we also have a bunch of platform specific uh, port hacks. Um, and we have some garbage tools, PG and then Bruce would probably yell at me if I called it garbage, but um, <laughs> it's what it turns your code into. Sorry. Um, <laughs> all right, so components of the back end, right? This isn't all of them. OK? This is just kind of most of the big ones. And I'm not going to get an opportunity to hit on all of these. This talk is simply not sufficient for that. I could give probably an all-day tutorial about if we tried to go through all of it. But I wanted to try to hit on all the different pieces so that you kind of know where to look, right? 
And so I'm going to try to go through these. I'm going to try not to take too long because I know it's a big, long, ugly list. And at least half of you, I think, probably have already seen this list. Who all has looked through this source tree before? Okay, okay. So there's some folks in here who haven't seen it. All right. So the access. Um, access is where we define how we do things like talk to indexes. Right? These are all of your access methods for um, different types of data. The you know, gist and gin indexes, B-tree indexes, the heap access methods are all defined under access. You probably don't need to play with this too much. Right? The catalog. This is where all those things that are in PG underscore catalog, this is kind of how they're built. Right? What we have inside of the catalog directory are sets of C structures, essentially. Right? And we kind of make them into magic catalog actual tables. It's kind of really interesting how that whole process works. And it's changed a little bit over time. But the general idea is that if you need to go add some new catalog, um, maybe you want to add a new column to PG class, for example, this is where you would go to do that. You'd go in and you'd add it into there. You'd go update all of the um, seed data. So we actually have a whole bunch of seed data in uh, some of these catalogs that is kind of the guts to get the system going enough to actually work and run. Right? So, but that's where all the actual catalog tables are defined. Um, what's really kind of interesting about how we do this now is um, with PG upgrade, so upgrading is a big part of how we do you know, Postgres. Right? We actually support binary in place upgrade now. But we don't upgrade in place the catalog. So that's what allows us to be able to go from 9.1 to 9.2 is what we do is we actually dump the catalog out in kind of a logical definition of it and then re-import it back into the new uh, Postmaster that's running under the new major version. So it is possible to add columns in here and whatnot that won't break things during an upgrade, which is really important. Um, the commands directory. This one I find myself in a fair bit, actually. So this is where a lot of your kind of utility commands are defined. and. Things like the copy statement, if you want a monkey with copy, which is what we'll talk about a little bit later, this is where you would go to modify um, the actual code behind what copy does. Um, other things in there, you know, the create table statements are in there, vacuums in there. This is where a lot of those commands that you would actually run are, are defined in the C code side of it. Now, they go through a lot of gyrations before they actually reach this code, right? They go through other parts of the code I'll talk about in a minute. But if you want to go look at the C code that's actually run when you write that, when you type that command in on the command line, this is it. Um, the executor, oh boy, the executor is its whole thing, right? The way that the executor works is that you'll actually get kind of this tree of what to go do, and the executor essentially walks that tree and does it. I'm not going to try to do any more about that. The executor could be a talk in and of itself. Um, foreign is where we do foreign data wrappers. So we now have a Postgres foreign data wrapper finally in, and it's going to be in 9.3. Um, if you want to go see how that works and all the different gyrations, go look there. If you want to just understand how foreign data wrappers work, there's a file FDW in there. So that's where I would probably recommend starting with. It's a lot simpler to work with. Is it? Oh, I'm sorry. OK. The, there is a file FDW. I guess it's in contrib. It's not under foreign. Really? That's because this is the foreign. I'm in the back end. Sorry. This is going to be the entire talk. I'm going to be getting corrected, just FYI, <laughs> which is perfectly right. <laughs> so the foreign, sorry, foreign is where we define how you, how like a file FDW is written against this. Actually, I don't even think the Postgres FDW is in there either. It's how, it's the structure for how we, if you wanted to go modify something about how create foreign wrapper works, or create foreign table works. That's where it would be is in here. Getting ahead of myself already. Um, so lib. Lib is not an external library. Okay, In the back end directory, the lib is just kind of utility, general purpose, misc functions. We also have a util directory. It's that part of it. I don't know that it's really clear what goes in which place, to be honest with you, for my two cents. Um, there's a libpq directory. This is not the libpq that gets linked in. This is the back end's interface on the back end side to libpq. In some ways, it's kind of the, the protocol definition for interfacing back with libpq. Right? Uh, main is main. Um, <laughs> nodes. OK, so who understands what nodes are? 
Uh, okay. I come, some of you I know do. Um, so the way Postgres works, and I'll talk about nodes a little bit later, but basically it builds trees of these nodes. It's all in-memory data structures, right? None of, no, nodes themselves never get written out to disk. But it's uh, a tree structure that allows us to say, okay, what kind of a node is this? Um, the optimizer, it, this is where all of your costing stuff comes from, right? So if you do an explain, right? So who's done an explain on a query before? Ah, uh, thank you. All right, so if you run and explain, you get all those cost numbers back, right? That's coming out of the optimizer. You don't actually see everything that the optimizer sees, though, right? What happens is that the planner and the optimizer work together to come up with what they think the best plan is, and then that's what they'll return, right? And then you'll see all the costing numbers at each of the individual nodes. So in that explain tree are the different nodes, right? They're pulled out and written nicely and whatnot and have appropriate information for each one. But all of that is kind of this uh, joint work between the planner, the optimizer, and the node's uh, infrastructure. The parser, we'll get into the parser a bunch in a bit, but this is where we do uh, the lexical analysis and the actual parsing um, of, the, of every command that comes in through Postgres. All right, uh, port is just back-end specific port things. The postmaster, the postmaster is that main process that kind of answers everything that comes in, right? He's the guy who answers it, forks off a back end, and does all of that kind of work. Handles uh, forking off the background workers that also run. The postmaster handles all of that, and that's what that uh, directory is all about. Um, regex is actually um, Henry Spencer's regex library, um, which is also used by Tickle. But to be honest with you, I think we're becoming the de facto maintainers of it. Um, I don't think the Tickle folks, uh, they're, they're great and all, but I feel like we're pushing more bugs to them than the other way around. More bug fixes, I should say. Um, not that there's a lot, but still. Uh, replication is where we deal with all the replication changes, things like wall shipping, um, stuff like that, uh, as well as the components to read them back in uh, for doing uh, like hot standby. The rewrite engine, um, it, whenever you define a, a view, you get a rule, actually, that's defined for it that basically takes any queries that are going to be run against that view and turns around and use a, uses a rule to reconstruct them. That's what the rules directory is all about. Um, it, it, or the rewrite directory is about is managing all of those rules and how we do all of that. Snowball stemming, I'm not going to get into it. It's about full text search. Um, the storage layer is what actually handles direct file I.O. So we don't, we actually have this kind of abstract layer. Um, there was always this notion way back when that we would actually have multiple pluggable storage options. That never really panned out, and there's way too much there right now to make that happen, I think. Maybe someday. But that's, what the, that's where it goes, is dealing with actual file level file access, figuring out what directory, what file to go open, managing file descriptors. That kind of stuff is handled by the storage um, infrastructure. Uh, traffic cop. Traffic cop is where the queries come in, um, and that's what kind of marshals them through the whole process of planning a query, executing a query, returning results, all of that stuff goes through there. Uh, T-search is the general um, full text search component. And then utils is just, again, kind of random back-end useful functions. Um, I'll touch on a couple of them in a bit. All right, so you have an idea for something that you want to write. You have some new cool thing you want to do. Where would you begin, right? And I'll tell you, this is my personal preference in general, is to start with the parser, right? When I want to go add some new cool thing, I generally go open up gram.y and say, what, am I, what do I need in here to do this? Um, the whole idea there being that, at least from my perspective, once you understand how it is going to work grammatically, it actually drives some of the way that it actually has to be implemented, right? Because you have to be able to have people be, um, articulate to you in terms of the back end, what you want done, right? And that's actually a pretty challenging thing to get right a lot of the time. Ask the SQL committee if you're not sure. Um, it's also something that's really hard to get agreement on a lot of times. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's hard. But in general, I would say you want to start with kind of the definition of what you want to do. And that really does start with the grammar a lot of the time, or the semantics, or however you want to you know, articulate that, the whole point being that you need to get agreement about that up front, ideally, at least on an initial way to proceed. Now, you get into the code, you discover you can't make it work that way, whatever, you have to rework it, that happens. But 
that's where I would tend to start. Um, the grammar is defined in, in SRC backend parser. We have a lexer. That handles all the tokenization of all of the different um, things that come in, all the different queries that get tokenized by the lexer first before they get passed into the actual grammar itself, which is in gram.y. Um, I don't think you tend to have to change the lexer. I don't think I've ever had to change it myself, so probably don't need to worry about it at all. Um, the lexer is built with flex. The grammar itself is built by Bison. Um, it's pretty typical. If you've ever written a you know, C compiler or something in school or whatever, or any kind of compiler like that, you would recognize it. Um, it's very much just that way. And yes, I have my instant messenger stuff. Whatever. Sorry. All right, modifying the grammar. So I don't know who all here knows a whole lot about grammar, but I want to give a really quick introduction to how this stuff works. Right? So a grammar is a set of productions. Okay? You have a, a statement level. That's the top level. It's kind of main, if you will, in the grammar. Right? And then what that does is that's just a list of ors. Right? So if you're familiar with regexes, it's just like this or this or this or this. Right? That's all it is. Okay? And so you actually, there's one really big production called statement in the grammar that lists all the top level commands that can be seen. Right? If you want to add a new top level command, that's where you go to go add your new production in. Um, if you want to just modify something existing, like a copy statement, you would not have to modify the statement level one at all. You just go find that copy statement production and modify it. So this is the actual one that I pulled out of my whatever version of Git, the Git master uh, that I'm looking at. This is the copy statement for copy. Right? What you'll see in here is copy is actually an independent token. Okay? And you'll see that in, the, um, in the, one of the keywords lists. Right? It's a, and that's why it's all capitalized. I wanted to kind of point that out because as, I don't know that it's required, but it's certainly something that we notionally do is actually have things um, capitalized that are actual tokens. And then other things like opt binary, this is actually another production. That if you need to go look up what that production means, you go look in you know, another part of the grammar for wherever op binary is defined. Now, all of these top level commands in the actual file themselves, they tend to all stick together. Uh, they don't have to, but it's usually a lot easier to understand how it works when everything's together that goes together. And so if you are modifying things in here, you want to keep to that as well. Um, some things like qualified name or opt column list, those are things that are going to be defined in kind of towards the end of the file, as I recall. And they have, um, this because a lot of different things use them, they're very generalized and very useful. Right? So that's the whole copy statement. And then what you have underneath that production, when that production finally rolls back up and matches, what you're going to have here is a bit of C code okay, underneath of it. It's kind of like a template C code, though, right? Because what's going to happen is Bison's going to take that block of C code, run it through a template that's going to go pick out things like $3 which doesn't make any sense in C, and replace it with the actual third position token that's coming back from the other productions. Right? And so here you can see relation. That's coming out of qualified name there. Okay? So that's really quick how you work with Bison in writing grammar. Um, all right. So if we wanted to actually go modify a copy statement, right? So you need to modify the C template code based on what you need to do. You need to add whatever your new thing is into the copy production. And I'll, I'll show a diff of this in a minute. Um, and then again, I kind of went over this already, but the C code is extracted by Bison, run through the templating, changes it over to $3, and then it's compiled as part of the overall grammar, right? So if you want to see the resulting C code, after you run Bison, there's a gram.c that you can go look at. And you can go find where copy statement is in there, and you can see the actual C code that gets generated for a copy statement. Um, in terms of the actual, in terms of the parsing of that copy statement, um, you, there's a couple of other places that you need to make sure you go update um, things like keyword lists, and if you add, if you need to add a new keyword, um, you want to try in general to add things into the unreserved keywords. You don't want to create new top-level keywords without a lot of discussion, a lot of, you know, because if it's truly a reserved keyword, then you know, if you wanted, if some user is creating a table with that name. That's going to potentially break for them, unless they're using double quotes around it, which most people don't. But that's the point, right? If you actually make it a whole new key, uh, fully reserved keyword, yes? So if, if you do need to add a fully reserved keyword, what other tools do you want to sort of look at in order to like, not break everything 
Um, PG dump, I think, actually, I mean, PG dump will, I don't think we have to have it. We don't have a separate definition of the keywords in PG dump, I don't think. I think it uses the same sets that we have. Yeah, yeah. So I think if you update it in here as a reserved keyword, the PG dump that's compiled against this version will automatically realize it's now a reserved word and will quote it when PG dumping against an older database or against a newer database. But that's actually one of the reasons why you always want to run PG dump uh, from the newer version of Postgres or really from whatever version that you want to eventually load into is because that version will know what all of the reserved keywords are for you know that load that version that you're going to be loading the data into. <sighs> all right, so here is a bit of a diff for gram.y. Um, I kind of cleaned it up a little bit and whatnot by hand, so it won't. I don't think it would actually apply. Um, but here at the top, we're adding in compressed. You can see that here, right? So it goes committed, compressed instead of committed concurrently. Okay, so you add that in at the top as a new. Um, Oh, has a new token type, right? That's what that is, so it's a new token type. And then here I can now say, okay, this new token type is being added into the OR set for the um, opt option, for the copy opt item, right? So in the prior definition of the copy statement, you saw in that production a reference to copy opt item, right? That then goes to a whole slew of OR statements along with the little magical one at the bottom that allows them to be appended to have more than one, essentially, um, on it. So this is what it does, right? I add compressed in here. I, mu I write my little bit of C code. Dollar, dollar inside of this. You saw dollar three referred to you know, the result of this production. Dollar, dollar is what this, or the result of the third production. Dollar, dollar is me, right? It's what I'm going to return up, right? So I refer to myself as dollar, dollar. The guy above me, if I'm in the third position, refers to that result as dollar three. All right, and here I say, okay, I'm going to make a default element, which basically is going to make it's going to call make integer. So make integer is going to create a node. Okay, so we have a whole bunch of different things that create these nodes, and I'll, I'll hit on nodes a little bit later on. But it's going to make an integer node. It's going to then going to make this element, and it's going to assign it to this, and then that node is going to get passed back up. Okay, so these are these are all nodes that are getting built here out of this expression tree, in this case. And then here I had to add this compressed to unreserved keywords, um, because now that I'm using it in here, it can't be. It has to be more than just a word, right? It can't be anything anymore. It's unreserved, meaning it, you can still use it for tables and whatnot. But it's still a keyword. It's still used in the grammar. I think I got all that right. <laughs> Nobody, nobody's raising their hand to correct me, so I'm happy. All right. <laughs> so what about the actual code, right? So in copy.c, which is inside of src backend commands, right? we have a whole bunch of stuff we have to do. But in there, there's a function called process copy options, which makes it really convenient because that's where it processes all of the options that get passed to it from the grammar, like this compressed option. And you see I had an actual string, literal string, inside of that. That's where we'll, we'll actually see how that gets used in copy.c in a minute. All right. There's also uh, copy state information. Um, so this is just something I want to touch on a little bit. If you have state information, or you have structs and whatnot that you're writing in, um, that you're writing that you need, generally, if they're only ever used inside of your .c file, you don't necessarily need a .h for them, right? You can just put it at the top of your .c file. That's acceptable, OK? You, not every struct has to be defined in some .h file somewhere, right? In fact, this is one of the core things about Postgres is that all of these pieces are modular, right? And they only expose the things that they're supposed to, that are supposed to be used by other parts of the code. And that, and that modularity is a big reason why Postgres is able to be built as big and as good and as awesome as it is, is because we keep all of these things separate. And when you hear hackers complain about layering violations or level violations or whatever, it's because you're you know, accessing some part of the code using something that you really should be going through something else to get to. right? You should be going through the proper channels, if you will, to go do it. You shouldn't just you know, go write something out to a file on disk somewhere without going through the storage system, for example. All right, so here's where the option handling is in copy.c. 
Um, what you have at the top of the file is a copy state data structure, right? I'm going to add my new Boolean in, in here just called compressed. All right, this is all it's doing is tracking whether I said that this is going to be a compressed stream coming through the copy or not. And then in here, inside of process copy options, I actually write the new code in here that says what I do when I see that option come through from the parser. So here I'm just doing a comparison against def name, right? And I say compressed, which is what the parser passes me in. Um, and then it's just a literal string. It could be anything, but it makes sense to have it be this. And then you know, I have a little bit of an if def around if I have zlib, which is required for this option, then I can say, OK, if C state compressed is already set, then I'm going to throw an error because you pass it to me twice. Otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and say, you know, get the, get the Boolean value that's being passed in, right, which is going to be true in this case. And then I have a little else clause here saying if I'm not compiled with these lib support, I'm going to throw an error, right? So e-report error is a way of throwing an error, and it does a lot of your cleanup for you. We'll talk a little bit more about the error structure later, but it makes it really easy. And that's it. We've added a new option to copy. Doesn't do anything, though, right? <laughs> That's kind of a problem. All right. Um, yeah, lots of changes need to be made to copy.c for this particular patch. Um, I'm just going to kind of go over the general structure of what I did. I'm not going to go into it. For one thing, it didn't get committed and is probably not going to. Well, maybe. We'll see. Um, what I did was, so copy has kind of this, um, this state machine. And I added a new compressed state. And then I also added a new set of. Um, File handles that have to be tracked. So you have to track them as GZ files instead of file stars. Yes, Magnus. Thank you, Magnus. <sighs> um, if anything shows up there in the upper right, please ignore it, particularly if it has Magnus's name on it. Sorry. So you also have to use GZ read and GZ write in order to write to and from this. Um, data as it comes in and out, when you're dealing with compressed data, you tend to have to have two different buffers. You have the buffer of the you know, compress data that's coming in, and then you have to uncompress it into another buffer, and then you pass that buffer off to the next guy to do whatever processing, parsing, and you got to keep all these pointers in sync. It's a little bit hairy, but it's not, I did it, so it's not the end of the world, I guess. Um, here's the diff stat from the, the resulting patch. Um, as you can see, most of the work is in uh, copy.c. Um, some of the other changes that I had to make, um, right now, we have uh, inside of storage, we have this allocate file and free file. And what those do is they just uh, they basically are used to cache file descriptors. right? So each part of the code doesn't have to worry about what the file descriptor is for x or y or whatever. right? We have this, or whether we need to close it or not. We have this cache of file descriptors. And the storage system will actually go handle, you know, once it's filled up all the file descriptors that it has available to it, it'll expire out old guys and bring new ones in and all this magic behind it. Well, that only dealt with regular file descriptors. I had to add some special ones for allocate file GZ and free file GZ. Because when you free those, you have to go through Zlib, basically, to do it right. Um, yeah, so I had to do that. I had to do regression test updates. So that's what SRC test is where all of our regression test suite is. And regress, um, and you put, basically, you go add stuff into input and then make sure that it matches what's in output. And then when we run the regression test, generally what we do is we run the input and we compare the results to what the result, expected results are, essentially. Um, yeah, keyword list, copy.c, documentation, copy.html. So that's kind of it um, in terms of what I'm going to talk about with regard to my patch for copy. Does anybody have any questions about that? I'm going to start jumping into. Kind of the second half of the talk is going to be a much more general, here are some different subsystems to work with, and here's how you use them, and that kind of stuff. No questions. All right. That is why my patch didn't get committed. How about that? <laughs> oh, actually, I have one more slide about this, right? This is, why my, this is part of why my patch didn't get committed, because somebody Happened to be reading, you know, happened to be thinking about the same kind of a problem and wrote something way better. So my my takeaway from this is follow the mailing list closely. Um, I I try to follow them pretty closely, but I don't always. Watch for others who are working on similar capabilities, right? Try to think about 
general answers to problems, not about specific ones. So for example, in this case, when you just run a program, you can use whatever kind of compression you want, um, whereas you can't necessarily with the version that I did. However, there's an interesting little side note about this. This will do copy from program, but everything that talks to the actual back end has to be uncompressed by the time it gets there. Right? So you can see we do Zcat here. What we're going to do is that'll be a Zcat that'll run on the server side in a separate process, and then it's just going to pipe that data back in. So when the back end actually gets it, it's actually already decompressed. That's fine when it's on a local system like that, but when it's on the other side of a network, right, and you actually wanted the data to be compressed while going across the network, it's not as ideal. So this particular solution doesn't do compressed across the network, which mine did, unless you do something really disgusting, like send it to some Unix pipe on Unix file system pipe on the remote end with cat and then zcat from that. I don't know. It could get really ugly. But it's probably good to start at the mailing list. Yes, and that's kind of what I was getting at originally. On is if you have an idea, I would suggest writing up a wiki page on it initially, and then go talk to the mailing list, saying this is my idea. Here's what I, how I think it'll work. Maybe have a little bit of a sketch of what the grammar is. Um, I didn't do that. <laughs> All right, so for kind of the second half of the talk, we're going to talk about what I would call hacking the Postgres way. Right, so Postgres has kind of specific special ways for doing lots of different stuff, right? We have our own memory management system. We have our own error logging system. We have our own linked list implementation. I'm not going to go into like the details of all of these, but I wanted to kind of hit on them and try to give you guys an idea of where to go look if you want to go hack the back end, what are the different pieces you need to think about, and try to give you an understanding of that stuff that I was doing, that other C code that called these random functions, this is where you would go look to see how they're defined and how they're used. All right, memory handling. So in Postgres, we have what are called memory contexts. Okay? Everything that you ever allocate when it comes to memory should be allocated through a memory context because it's how we make sure we clean things up when we're done, right? So they're allocated through PG malloc, which really is palloc. It's actually, I think it actually, there is a PG malloc as well, isn't there? I'm, I'm trying to think why I put PG malloc in there. Yeah, maybe it's, maybe it's the front end, sorry. No, that should be palloc, brain fart. Um, so when you're in the back end code, you use palloc, P-A-L-L-O-C, right? You don't have to do a whole lot special with it, right? You just call it and it will happily go allocate memory in whatever the current memory context is, which probably 90% of the time is right, okay? If it's not right, then you have to think about, well, should you be switching to that memory context to do whatever you're doing? So what we have are, we have what's called a top memory context. This is kind of connection long or back end long, right? So if you allocate something in the top memory context, it's going to be there the whole lifetime of the back end. Okay? And so in some cases that makes sense, but you have to be really, really careful with it because if you have a leak in this, or if you have something that's operating on a per tuple or per query basis, um, you're going to run into problems because you'll keep accumulating memory in there. Because the whole point of this structure is to avoid having to remember to free every little thing. Okay? So you have a top memory context, then you have a per query context, and then you have a per tuple context. All right. So again, a lot of these things are kind of handled in the code that you're probably looking at to modify already. So generally, you can just use palloc. Um, but if you're, you know, if you're looking at it, and you are doing something in a, in a, maybe it's in a per query context, but you actually want to operate on the individual tuples for whatever reason, you know, and you are looping through all of those tuples. Then you probably and you're calling functions, then you probably want to change the memory context to be the per tuple context, and then use that instead, or a per tuple context. So that and here's the other part about this, right? If you have code that ends up calling other functions, like user level functions or other things that are outside of your control, you really want to make sure you have this memory context set correctly, because that way they will be allocating their memory in the right context. And when you're done with that and that context goes away, you know all that memory gets freed up. Yeah.
Yes, yes, that's right, yeah. Yeah, if you're, uh, just to kind of reiterate what, uh, what Joe was saying, if you're in a set returning function, you can't have a per tuple context be used if you're returning something that's going to go outside of where you're doing your per tuple work, right? It's going it to need to be in a per query context so that when it actually goes out, it doesn't get freed when your function exits what it was doing on the per tuple basis. Any other questions or comments about memory context? I mean, it seems pretty simple, but it, it's important to understand. Whenever you're hacking the back end, you have got to use memory contexts or things will go really, really ugly. This is actually one other point to make here with this is if you're linking in other utilities, like utilities are outside of your control or even extensions or post GIS or anything like that, you run the risk of bringing in things that do out, you know, allocations that don't use our memory contexts. So you need to be very careful with anything like that where you know that they're allocating memory and they're giving you back some pointer, you better make sure you clean it up. Um, you're going to have to handle that yourself because they're not going to use PALIC. No, it's not necessarily true. I mean, if you, if you actually, it, I understand where you're coming from, but it's also not free to do. And if you can get away with it, you don't have to worry about waiting until the end of the context to throw it away because it makes sense, especially on per tuple ones. I don't necessarily think that you necessarily need to go try to pee free everything. I don't know, Tom, did you have a, I don't know, a voice of thought about that? Yeah. Um, if, you, if you know that you're in a situation where you're just you know you're locked with Florida context or whatever, that's what it's going to be. Right. Yeah. Right. There's, yeah. There's, there's an awful lot of kind of pre creating back end probability. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I guess more to the point, yeah, if, if you are doing lots and lots of allocations that are in a longer running um, context or what have you, that you can use P free. It's not that you can't, but you really ought to think about it as to whether it's really necessary or whether you know it'll just get cleaned up at the end of that tuple processing you know routine anyway, um, and that's one of the big ones. Is I, I you know using P free inside of a per tuple context is probably really overkill um, and unnecessary and a waste of cycles. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's a, just to reiterate what, what Andrew was saying is you can also have child context. In fact, kind of everything is a parent or child of something, right? But if you need to do it yourself, it's quite acceptable to create your own child context and then run with that for a while and then free it at the end um, if you have some use for that and you, you know, if you're outside of a per query or per tuple context, particularly probably in like utility commands or something like that where you're not really operating on an individual, uh, on, inside of a query context necessarily. Oh, 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 right, because it'll be called outside of, yeah, 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 yeah. You have to clean up yourself. Right, yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. So if you have things that are getting referenced out of index, you have to make sure you clean that up because those are not allowed to leak. Oh, okay. So Jin and Jist are that way, but the B tree ones are not. Yeah. Okay. Right, right. So that's just kind of an interesting point. So in general, it's good to understand the overall code that you're monkeying with, and because in some cases we'll have different strategies for how things are handled, such as memory, um, like Tom just pointed out, because Jin and Jist operate differently from how B tree handles memory. All right, logging from within the Postgres backend. So. What you use to do logging are e-report and error code and error message, right? The error level and the error message are required to be passed in. Uh, we actually have a style guide for error messages that is actually inside of our documentation that if you are doing anything that creates new error messages, you ought to be going and reading what the style guide says about how that should be constructed. Because um, it also, it actually is really important for things like translation. 
Um, it makes things a lot easier on the translators if, every, if everything follows the style guide, um, and they will yell at you. Um, <laughs> if it's error or higher from inside of when you're doing an e-report, this is one of the things I was mentioning earlier, it will actually clean up your transaction for you. It will clean up your memory context for you, and it will handle a lot of that. So you don't have to worry about you know, trying to do some go-to end or, or trying to deal with all of that yourself. If you come across a big error like this one here, right? No, I, I tried to do a GZ write and I got an error back from that process. I can just e-report error and I'm done, right? In general, I don't have to worry about trying to clean things up after this um, because it will go and handle all of these different things. Now that I think about it, I don't. I I might handle the file descriptor differently. I don't remember if we clean up file descriptors, although I don't know if I have to either. I don't think about that one. So just to point out, there are some things that don't get cleaned up, but. In general, your local state and, and anything having to do with the per query or per, um, per transaction, per query, these things, will, they'll all get kind of cleaned up for you because it'll actually roll back the transaction for you. It'll do a, you know, some long jump magic and get you into another area where it'll handle all of that cleanup. So this is how you should be doing your error handling from within the Postgres backend. Um, there are, you'll see sprinklings of other functions. There was actually a rewrite um, kind of, I don't know how long ago, from when we had, I think it was e-log. Is that the one that you're not supposed to use anymore? Or is it just for internal? Yeah, so the, there are other components to this. There's a whole bunch of documentation about it um, where it, this is all defined. Yeah. Documentation, yeah, yep, yeah. The, the error style guide is there. the The code style guide is too. the The actual the code style guide is in the developers fac, um, so you can find that too. I and I mentioned that later on also. That's true. Yeah, yeah. If you have if you're doing debugging or what have you, um, just to reiterate what Andrew said, then elog can be useful because it'll just write out directly. Um, it doesn't go through all the the same. Um, Structure is e-report and is not as complicated to use. Yeah. All right, catalog lookups. Um, so in Postgres we have what's called syscache. So syscache is kind of this backend cache that we have that handles catalog lookups. It's got some interesting semantics, and so you have to be kind of careful with it. Um, it's defined in, in utils cache um, in syscache.c. The general way the you know function to use that you can use to look things up is called search syscache. You pass in some key for some catalog entry that you want to go look up, and it will go and figure it out and return it back to you. Um, there are some convenience routines that do this for you um, for specific types of things that you might need to pull out. Those are defined in lsyscache.c. Um, some of the things that are really complicated about dealing with Postgres is this whole MVCC thing and snapshots and whatnot. So I want to hit on that a little bit, right? So when you're scanning the catalog tables, a lot of times you'll see code that's using what's called snapshot now. That means that they're just basically reading the heap from top to bottom directly. Right? They're not doing any filtering on it. They're going to see every row, whether it's dead, alive, anything. Okay? So you have to be careful of what the semantics are around using that. You don't want to just copy that blindly because you really need to think about what you're doing. So snapshot now is very, very tricky to use. Um, some of the cases that you can run into with that are cases where you'll see the same entry twice. Right? You might have a unique index on that, but it doesn't matter, right? Because the way Postgres does an update is that it does an insert and a delete, right? And while you're scanning through that, you might see the tuple that defines some table definition. And then somebody goes and drops that table, it gets marked as deleted in PG class, and then they create a new one. And what you'll do what'll happen is that'll get added at the end. Right? And then as you continue to scan through, you'll come across it again. Right? So those are cases you have to handle. There's an even more fun one that you have to handle, which is that you might not see that entry at all. Okay? Because what can happen is as you're scanning through, if it gets deleted off the end and inserted behind you, all right, now all of a sudden vacuum comes along or whatever, cleans that page up, it's gone, you don't see it at all. So whenever you're using snapshots now semantics, you have to be careful around this kind of stuff. Um, there are other snapshots to use, um, and you just need to look and see which ones are the right ones to use for whatever specific thing that you're working on. 
um, but it, it, it really needs to be thought through really carefully. Um, as I think I was mentioned in another talk, but I'll mention it here also, each individual query gets a snapshot, right? It's not, like these are, snapshots are distinct from transactions. I didn't really cover that, but I want to make sure people understand it. They are not the same thing, right? Um, if you were in Kevin's talk, he did a real good job of this. But basically, transactions can have multiple snapshots if you're in like read committed mode. It, you'll get a new snapshot every time a new query comes around because you're going to see whatever has been recently committed. So just be aware of those different semantics. Questions about catalog lookups? I know it's, it's very, very broad. I'm sorry, but there's only so much I can cover in an hour. But um, syscache is really useful. If you go look at you know, example code that's out there, that'll help a lot um, in terms of understanding how to use it and what parameters you need to pass to it and whatnot. And again, the helper functions are really useful also for looking up very specific things that you need to go find out of the system catalogs. Nodes. <sighs> All right, so PG has a node structure of expression trees. So this is, again, you know, the node structure is it's completely in memory. Each node has a type assigned to it, so it's kind of like a type and a blob inside of a structure. Um, what that allows you to do, though, is do what's called is a, like is a, and you can say, tell me what this is, and you'll be able to figure out what kind of a node it is and deal with it appropriately. Like an example of the executor, right? So the executor is happily going along, executing whatever it needs to. It needs to have an idea of, okay, what's this next node coming up that I need to go execute? Right, so we can do is a testing on it to figure that out and then go figure out what the right routines are to allow that node to do its job, like a sequential scan node or what have you. Right? The way you create new nodes in the back end is using make node. Um, the, there are helper functions around that, like make integer. Right? You saw that earlier in my grammar where I had make integer. That's actually just a wrapper or a, it's probably even a macro around make node that makes, an, makes one and sets it as an integer uh, type of node and then passes that back. If you wanted to go add your own node type, um, which can happen in, in a few cases, then you need to go into include nodes, nodes.h is where you would define your new node type. Um, and then when you have a new node type, Postgres needs to understand how to deal with making that node, copying that node around, whether it's equal to some other node. There's all these helper functions that exist inside of backend nodes that you need to go make sure that you've got all those functions written out for your new node that you're adding. Um, the way that I've done that in the past is basically, it's, it's really easy to say, OK, I want a node that looks like this, but is a little different. I'm going to copy that one um, in terms of the name of it, change the name of it, and then go grep for wherever it was used in, in backend nodes and make sure that I have functions that match up for whatever that type was. Um, there's also like copy. It has to do a deep copy, or I think there's options. There might be two functions there. One for a deep copy, one for not deep copy. I don't remember offhand. But the point is, is that you will have to do deep copies. You want to make sure that where you have to do a deep copy, that you're actually doing a deep copy and you're creating a whole new node that's independent of the old one um, in the event that you have code paths that do that, put it that way. <laughs> yes, yes. Typically, you can use a lot. And that's one of the really great things about Postgres is that we have macros for lots of stuff. Um, all over the code, and it's very convenient to be able to use those macros rather than writing your own stuff, and it makes it a lot cleaner to read, too, because it makes a lot more sense. Datums. Oh, boy. So datums are not nodes. Nodes are not datums, right? Datums are actual data, okay? They're, they're not part of the expression tree at all. They're actual data, okay? The, the structure for a datum is defined in postgres.h. Um, there's a whole ton of helper macros in there as well. Um, and so you want to be sure to use them. I just listed a couple here, in 32 get datum, right? So what that does is that create, builds a datum of an integer that you've passed in, right? So now you have some piece of data that is an integer that you have in C as an integer. You need to make a datum out of it because you need to pass it to somewhere else or you need to get it stored into a table somewhere or what have you. You can use in 32 get datum. And then you have the reverse is datum get int 32, which is if you have an, a datum that, ha that is an int 32, you can pass it into this, and it will return the actual int out of it. Yes, you could go do it yourself, too, but don't. Right? There's a reason why these macros exist, and you want to be using these macros and these helper routines to do that kind of work. And so 
one of the big things is when you're writing code, if you're not using these kind of helpers and you're trying to access data structures underneath the things, again, layering violations. Like, don't do that. It's evil. Um, and you will get your patch kicked to the curb if you try to do stuff, things, things like that. But this is really, really general about datums. I didn't even put what the, what the actual structure type is. It's essentially you have a datum type and then you have data. Um, questions? Wow. All right, tuples. Tuples are even more fun. So the heap tuple is defined in include access htuple.h. Um, the include directory is not doesn't exactly follow the uh, SRC backend directory structures, but in some cases they do. This is one of those cases. So the access methods for heap, which involve heap tuples, it does really correlate directly to you know SRC backend access, where all the methods are defined for it. Um, the heap tuple data structure itself is just an in-memory context uh, construct, rather. It's not what's actually written out to disk. Um, all it does is provide the length of the tuple, and then it gives you a pointer to the tuple header. Right? Then you have a tuple header, and that tuple header is then followed by the actual data. Right? The heap tuple is used in multiple different ways. The pointer that's in there could be a pointer to a disk buffer, like out in shared buffers. If that's the case and you're playing with it, you better make sure it's pinned, because if it's not pinned, what can happen is Postgres has a clock tweak algorithm which goes through, and once that it's gone through the shared buffer catalog enough times, it'll go, wait a minute, this guy's so old, he hasn't been used recently, I'm going to evict him and put something else there. So wherever you're playing with uh, blocks or, or disk buffers, you need to make sure that you're pinning them. I'm not going to talk about that here, though. Um, you can have a heap tuple that's empty. That's not as interesting. Um, it can be a single p-malloc chunk of uh, memory, or it could be independently allocated. Um, and there's also something called a memory tuple structure. So, or minimal, sorry, not memory, minimal tuple structure. So in the minimal tuple structure, what we do is we kind of throw away some of the extraneous columns that we don't need for whatever we're currently duping, doing. One of the places this is used is inside of the heat, um, hashing algorithms. Right? So we don't really need to have all your cmin, cmax, xmin, xmax, all that stuff doesn't need to be there necessarily inside of the hashing code itself. Right? By the time we get there, we're only seeing stuff that's valid for us anyway. Right? Something, somebody else lower down is handling that, the sequential scanner, what have you. And so what we do is we drop that out. But there's no way to distinguish a minimal tuple which doesn't have those columns from one that does. So you really need to know what you're doing, know what kind of a tuple you're getting, and uh, act appropriately with it. Questions about tuples? Wow. Well, here. There's more. Um, I think I hit on this already, but heap tuple header data um, in friends. There's a h tuple uh, underscore details dot h, which has additional details about uh, header tuple or heap tuples. Um, it includes a number of attributes. Um, whenever we have a tuple, we actually have a bitmap uh, along some other flags that go along with it that tell us like where all the nulls are in it. So we don't actually store nulls like inline anywhere, right? It's just a bitmap at the beginning of the tuple that says, you know, these positions have null values. So we never actually have to store them. And then the data actually follows the header. It's not included explicitly in the struct, which apparently we've had some fun stuff with. We do this all over the place. So just to kind of hit on something, we do this a lot of places where we'll have a structure like a header of some kind or, or what have you, and then we'll have the actual data follow immediately after that. You are almost never supposed to go access that data directly by doing some kind of offset, right? There will be macros defined. If you do it yourself, you should be providing macros for people to use to go get at that information. Um, you should never be doing kind of pointer offset stuff directly through um, to get at that data that is after the end of that struct. For one thing, there's portability risks because you have to know what the actual distance is. Um, because things have to be offset certain ways um, if you're going to actually use it in memory. Um, otherwise, you get signal bus exceptions and all kinds of other garbage. Um, so you want to make sure that you use the macros that are available for dealing with any kind of constructs like that. But it is something that we do a lot of, is we have a structure, and then we'll have data following that structure uh, actually in memory. And so when we go to allocate it, we allocate the structure plus whatever amount of data we need to have go after it. Toasting. Who here knows what toast is? All right. 
That also tells me at least half of you are still awake. This is great. All right. <laughs> so what happens with toast? Um, large values will get toasted. They'll get stored out of line. Um, they can get, you know, when it comes to on-disk representation, we have an actual separate table off on the side called a toast table, right? And what we'll do is we'll take that tuple and we'll take that, that datum out of that tuple and we'll stick it over in this toast table and just have a pointer to it from the main table, right? Um, Jan's around. He can probably answer any other questions you have about toast. But you need to be careful about it when you're dealing with datums in the back end, right? Because the datum that you get handed could be toasted. It may not have been detoasted, right? In fact, we try to only detoast stuff when we absolutely need to. We try to hold off on doing that because it's expensive. You know, if we have to detoast, we may have to go back out and get the actual toast value off of disk. We may have to decompress it because, well, we will have to decompress it if it's off on disk because anytime we toast something, we compress it first. So you have to be careful about whether the, the data that you're working with is actual values or whether it's been toasted or, or compressed or what have you. So these are things you have to be aware of um, because it's just one of the things that we do in the back end all over the place. Um, and if you're playing with, well, it's one of the things that happens in the back end all over the place. It's not, the, the code that deals with it is actually pretty well isolated, I would say. But still, it's something you have to deal with um, when you're working with datums in the back end. Questions about toast and whatnot. Um, just to clarify, you can actually have something compressed before it goes into the toast table. If we compress it and it's small enough to actually fit on the page, then after it's been compressed, we'll keep it in line. We won't actually put it in the toast table yet. So that's just another kind of caveat on that. All right, we're almost done, folks. Um, other subsystems. Lots of stuff has been done. Please don't go and write your own linked list implementation and try to submit it to Postgres, OK? Unless you're, who is it, Andres, who went and wrote the internal linked list one. Um, yeah. Generalized code, if you do write some new generalized thing, you should put it into one of the generalized areas. Don't write something that's very generalized and can be used by other stuff, and then stick it in your one little area. Because um, typically, you're going to want to use it across other things. Um, look at existing code. Real examples help enormously. Um, a lot of times, you'll see what you need. It'll also give you an indication of how to deal with portability concerns. Um, like if you want to write something that uses like a select loop, go look at how we do that in other places. Because guess what? On Windows, it's different. So you got to be careful and be, watch out for that kind of stuff. So you need to use the Postgres select. Um, coding style. Um, I always like to hit on this whenever I talk about code writing. Make sure your code fits in. right? Don't have your code look completely different from all the code around it. It's very jarring for people who are trying to do reviews, who are trying to read the code two months later, you know, anything like that. Beware of copy-paste. Um, follow the style guide that's in the FAQ. Comments. Comments are a really, 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 really big deal in Postgres. Our code is excellently commented. We want to keep it that way. If you find places where you think it could be better, please submit a patch. We're never going to complain about new patches that add more documentation to the back end. Always use C-style comments. We don't do C++-style comments. Um, generally, we have comments on their own lines and in their own blocks. The style guide goes over that a little bit. Um, also, I want to hit on, you always want to explain why you're doing something or why this makes sense or why this is necessary. Don't just try to write the comment saying what the code does. We can read the code. We understand that you know, we're getting the fifth value out of this, this array. The, the question is, why are we doing that? And why is that the right value? And that kind of stuff. Um, if you have a large code block, that goes for functions. Like Every function should have a decent sized comment block above it. But even for big things like large while loops, large if uh, or other conditionals, you want to make sure you have a good size block above it of a comment explaining what it does and why it does it. Uh, yeah. Submitting patches. Um, you want to use context diff um, or git diff, I guess it's acceptable nowadays. Um, in an ideal world, you would pick which one makes your diff actually more readable if someone wants to just read it. Um, I think in general we prefer context diffs because they typically are more readable um, because they don't mix things, but git diff is okay also, I guess. Um, make sure in your email to hackers you include a description of what your patch is, why it's doing what it's doing, and why it's useful to you. Make sure you have regression tests, documentation updates, and PG dump support if it's something that you're doing. And then register it on commit fest. That description of patch is a big deal. <laughs> Doing. 
Okay. A lot. Can you explain to people why that matters for you? Well, I write the Postgres weekly news and there's a section with patches in it. Which right. Supply that sentence. I don't have to infer it from reading your code. Right. Which I might not do as well as you'd like. Yeah, the, the main point there was that this is uh, Sir David Fetter, if you don't know him, he's the guy who does Postgres weekly news. So yeah, it would definitely help if you have a one-liner with your description, but also have a bigger description. I don't want all of a sudden to get patches that have one-line descriptions. It needs to have a one-liner and then a real paragraph explaining it. Thank you. Any questions? No. Huh.